So the two of you have a new edition of your book, Team Geek, coming out. But before we get to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about your backgrounds. How, where do you guys where come from, and what are you guys doing now? Um, I grew up in New Orleans, moved to Chicago, got a degree in Latin and Greek with a minor in ceramics. And that's and why he is that's, where he is today. That's why I'm in software, <laughs> that's why I'm in software engineering. Um, I worked at a bunch of tech companies. I worked at Apple, worked at a couple of startups, worked at Google with Ben for 10 years, and then um, now I started my own company last year. Excellent. Uh, I, I'm a Chicago native. Uh, I grew up in the suburbs and went to school in Chicago. I still live there. Uh, I, have a, I got my degree uh, at University of Chicago in mathematics, linguistics. Ended up going into software as well. But also I, I did a lot of music and theater on the side. Um, turns out software engineering pays a little better. So uh, I have ended up working with Fitz. We've been working together for like 16 years 17, now? 17, wow. 98 years. we started working 17, together. Across three jobs, right? Um, across three books. We started the, the Google Chicago office together. Yeah. And, um, and uh, then we ended up giving a lot of talks at O'Reilly conferences when we were at Google. And so that led to other things like the book. I was just going to yeah, follow up say, with like, that. Like, what, so what brought you together to write the book, and what inspired the building teams topic? Well, we, we, we wrote a book together in the early 2000s with Mike Pilato. Actually, yeah. On software version control for O'Reilly. and, and the, the subversion book. The subversion book, yeah, with right. the turtles, turtles on it. And um, it was... It was really it was a great experience, yeah. and then we started giving we, we started going to conferences, and giving talks on software version control, and we re one year we, it was two thousand five we decided you know everybody's giving technical talks at these conferences somebody needs to talk about the human side of software engineering. It was you you, you brought that yeah, to well, me. I think in particular it was you know we had spent so many years working on in the open source community right and so. Um, we had all these war stories about what it was like to manage an open source project and collaborate with all these people you've never seen before. And so when we went to OSCON that year, instead of giving a technical talk, we said, hey, why don't we give a talk about how hard it is to, to manage? Right? Yeah, and we so, titled it something really boring like, like, you know, how to have nice people work in the <laughs> yeah, right, right. And Nat right. Torkington was like, right. this is a terrible title. We're going to call it How to Deal with Poisonous People. Yeah, I see. And it was like, <laughs> I've never had tabloid. so many people in a room before. Yeah, um, it was amazing. Tabloid headlines work, I guess, right? And so. look, it was great. People really <laughs> got into it, and yeah. participated, asked lots of questions and comments, and then we we did it like oh, like twenty four times in two years. Yeah, it was, wow. it's like Good. group therapy is what we discovered. It's like you know yeah. these engineers they want to talk about their experiences, and so we sort of got on this kick where every year we would come to OSCON with a different talk about how to do with Google people, I mm -hmm. Google I O as yeah. well, or PyCon, we different different, yeah. different, but it was always a different talk. Each year about how to deal with people, how to manage people, how to how do people interact with software, um, and it was great, and we had a lot of fun. And then after what we had maybe six or seven talks, sort of booked up, and um, someone at O'Reilly came to us and said, you know, maybe it was our editor. It was our editor. Yeah, right? it, was it, was Mary. it was Mary, right? Yeah, yeah. So she said, hey, maybe you should turn this into a, another book. I think and she I, threatened us actually. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Mary. Yeah. <laughs> so we did. So we turned it into another book, um, uh, specifically about um, the human side of software engineering. It's called Team Geek. Came out three years ago, about 2012. Yeah, 2012. Yeah, right. and it was it was really well received in the engineering side. And uh, you know, O'Reilly came back to us and said, you know, we we'd like to see this uh, sort of reinvented for a broader audience because mm -hmm. it does apply to a much broader audience than just engineers. I think there's lots of great information there for anybody that works in a team to, to make something or create something. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what led to the new edition. Right. So the new edition is called Debugging Teams. We gave it a new name because. We have expanded it, like he said, to make it a little broader audience, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, we, we originally were focused on software engineering because that was what we knew, right? right? And all the stories were about software engineering. But then, like Fitz says, we realized that almost all of the advice we were giving could be applied to any creative group, right? Mm -hmm. like it could be could be a church group. It could be a bunch of architects. It could be anything, right? Um, right. So um, we went through the book, and we sort of tried to broaden the subject a little more, add more material, generalize it a little more, so you don't need to be a techie to read it necessarily. Right. right. I mean, there's still great. There's still a lot of examples from engineering from our experience, right. but really, it's it's targeted at, at just the general public, anybody who works with more than one person, which is most people. On stuff that's creative. On stuff that's creative, right? right. It's assembly line, assembly line, line like you know, <laughs> printing out <laughs> widgets type of thing. But yeah, yeah in creative industries, whether it's knowledge workers or. Yeah. Uh, but it could be a, just any community, really. Mm -hmm. I agree. And so what would you say is the most important thing you learned while writing the book? Don't work with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't code like my brother. Right. Don't code uh, like my brother. Um, what did we learn? Um, uh, it was not so easy to turn talks into prose. Right? 
I remember we had those thousands of note cards and were lying around. Yeah. Um, uh, I think, well, I mean, I don't know. It's, I think going through it, we had done we had done in a previous book, right? So we knew. I think we knew like what was the in process. Store, yeah. How long? How much work it would be? But, I think a lot of it was the feedback we got from people was, was uh, taught us yeah. a lot. Like we, mm-hmm. as we went through chapters, we had a trusted group of about fifteen people, and we'd fire stuff off to, and yeah. like say, "Look, please take off the gloves. Give us honest feedback about what you uh, like or don't like about this." And our friends were really honest with us, <laughs> which is great and valuable, right? <laughs> Super valuable. Like we talked a lot want. about the importance of criticism. Like finding right. somebody who will actually look at something you said, like that you create, and say, "You know, I think it could be better in this way." Constructive feedback. Mm-hmm. Is worth its weight in gold because so many people just think it's blow smoke. Some people, oh, it's people great. think you want like yeah. just your, uh, affirmation to say, right. "Oh, this yeah. is great." Yeah, yeah. and so, um, so I'd say I, mean, I learned a lot from that. A lot of people pointed out, like, "Well, you're saying this, and it could mean that," or "This is actually I don't think what you intend." So I, it, it definitely refined it. And as we give the mm-hmm. talks, mm-hmm. and as we've spoken on the book as well, we get questions every time we speak that sort of always give me a little something to think about, I think. Right. Was there anything specific in the feedback that, like, maybe changed something dramatically in the book, or...? Yes, the rewrite. The, the Which one do you think? A, a, the rewrite of Team Geek. Right before we were done with it, like a month before, we stopped and remember we rewrote the oh whole thing. Oh, my gosh, I forgot about that. that was, so, wait, back up, 10 steps. So, <laughs> yeah, what, what we realized is that there's, yeah. there's a group of people, there's two camps of people that work together as, as in teams. Um, well, you talk about this a little bit. I'm, well, I'm trying to remember really which, what, which one point is, you're thinking. This is green versus blue, right? Oh, okay, right. right? So, right, we had talked about, basically the, the criticism, the metacriticism is that we were not appealing to those who are, who are just more inherently skeptical about, right? I mean, like, about the importance of people. This is back when we were targeting okay. it strictly at engineering, right? Mm-hmm. And we were writing it for an audience where we sort of assumed, understood the value of, of social connections, and they just wanted to do it better. And somebody pointed out to us, well, you know what? A lot of engineers, a lot of programmers, are not people, 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 <laughs> no, like, or people. Period. <laughs> right? And you know, and they they actually, and we did encounter this. A lot of them were just sort of like skeptical, like, why should I even care? Why should I even think about people? Like, I'm here to write code, right? And those folks are the folks who probably need the book the most, but they're also the ones least likely to pick up a yeah. book that looks like a self help. Mm. Psychology book, right? right? So there was this question, like, well, how do we how do we address that level of that kind of skepticism? Yeah, right. We had to go and change a bunch of things. Yeah, so we retooled so, it really, tried trying to, yeah. to sell it and as well to that to, to the person, the non people people, mm-hmm. and show them why this is important. Right. And it's not just some moral statement, but really the reason it's important is because it allow spending a little bit of time on the human element of doing something together with other people allows you to spend a lot more time doing that thing, right. or creating that thing, and less <laughs> right. time. Yelling or screaming right. or disagreeing. So or right back. If you do this, you will get to write more code and better code. Right. right. It's right. not just because you're good. You want to be a good person. Or, right. So right. Right. There's an actual outcome. There's an actual you. outcome yeah. that will help you write better code, and ship better products. Right. Yeah. So, and now you guys yeah. have a talk that's targeted at leaders and how to build teams and manage people. So, yeah. what would you say is maybe some of the biggest mistakes leaders are making? Right now, in team building and managing, the biggest mistake. I mean, there's, there's just so many. So many. Like, I mean, there's. The, I think the biggest thing is, is for leaders is, you have to resist the urge to manage people. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. I think that's, <laughs> like that's what we say when, when there's a new manager in the office or a new leader. Yes. Right? You take them aside and you say, the first rule of management is resist the urge to manage. Yeah. Don't right? manage Which anybody. Because <laughs> people are like, well, I'm a manager now. I'm going to manage. And like they go around and they suddenly change their personality and they start like giving commands and it's it's very weird. It's like they're living some some horrible stereotype. Right? And they're they're, they're like, miserable too. It's right. Right. They're just and like, everybody hates them. They feel like they <laughs> have to become this sort of like <laughs> jerk, but mostly it's just like stay out of the way and. You know, it's the servant leader thing we talk a lot about. Right. The idea that a manager's main job is not to bark commands, but to actually aid the team and mm-hmm. sort of provide cover, do whatever it takes to remove roadblocks and make them more efficient. So really being a manager is about getting out of the way and then just trying to, you know, um, figure out what they need, right? Um, right. And sometimes they need direction. Right? It depends on individuals. They may say, hey, I'm confused. Help me figure out which way to go. And that's fine. But right. You know, that's that's requesting commands as opposed to right. receiving them, whether you like them or not. Right, right. and then your approach and to so, how you give that advice yeah. instead of right. barking the command. Yeah. yeah. When people ask you for advice, it's very different than you telling them what to do. Right, right. 
And so on the flip side of that, what kinds of specific advice would you give to leaders of things they should do? Are there, are there a couple little oh, we have nuggets? Many, many patterns, right? Sure. Many, uh, what's the first one? Be calm. Uh, the I think the hardest the thing is, is yeah. uh, most, like, many individual contributors, they, they tend to be cynical. They tend to have a very specific mm -hmm. taste. Like, I like this, or I like that, or I want this done this way. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, they're cynical about a lot of things, and they sort of take a, everything with a grain of salt. Um, if you do that as a leader, that's amplified greatly, and your team really can amplify that in a negative manner. So you kind of have to tone that down a great deal and remember that you know, the, the more of a leader you get, the higher you get up in your org, the more powerful any tiny little thing you well, uh, are becomes. The, the way I talk about this is when you're a leader, you're, you're acting. I mean, it doesn't mean you're dishonest, but you are always on stage. I think, mm -hmm. think of it as like people are watching you, right? And eat, when you eat your lunch, when you're sitting at your computer doing email, you, people are always watching you for cues and how is he reacting to this or what's he doing, right? And your, if you if you are feeling frustrated on a particular day, right, it is still important for you to play this role of, of being slightly optimistic, having a good attitude, right? Even if you may not feel that inside, yeah. right? Because it's contagious, right? If you start acting bitter just because you're having a bad day one day, it will spread it will. very quickly because they're taking their cues from you. And I have a, I have a great example. Of this. I yeah. didn't even realize this for years. So I, I was a site lead for Chicago Engineering for a while, and now Ben's a site lead, mm -hmm. and. Um, Nicole, who ran the cafeteria and the micro kitchens, she knew when I was in, uh, out of town and when I was in town. Mm -hmm. Not because she saw me, but by the volume of Coke Zero that was drank on the floor, <laughs> in our engineering floor. Wow. And I said, I didn't drink that much. She's like, oh, no, you didn't. But when you it's were around team. drinking it, people would see you with it, and they, they would just go grab one, too. <laughs> I was like, you're kidding me. She's like, I swear. Lemmings. And I was like, holy cow. But it's just like it's an unconscious thing. That, yeah, yeah. You know? And so that attitude, I think, is really important. Uh, what other what other important things? I mean, gonna, I mean, well, there's there's also um, I'm trying to think about the other things. Just um, talking about being aware of social and technical health, right? This yeah. is sort of a roadmap I give I give to new leaders. Right? I say, look, your job, if you're not writing code anymore or, or whatever, if you're just the leader of a creative group, right? There's there's sort of two things you need to watch. Well, how is the social health? How is the technical health? And by technical health, I mean are you guys moving in the right direction? Is the product moving in the right direction? Does everybody know what they're working on, right? Um, and you, you provide input there, right? Um, social health is, are, are people actually happy, right? Like, is the team culture, is it working? Are people being supportive? Are people happy to come to work? If not, why not, right? And if, if you ignore either one of those, things are gonna go bad, right? Um, and there are particular strategies on how to monitor and help those things. And, and another thing is, uh, when you become a leader, people will come to you and ask questions. They'll, they'll come to you and ask you for advice. And the best thing you can do is ask them questions right back. And it's not being dishonest or disingenuous or evasive, but when people ask questions or advice, the, the first thing you want to do as a leader is like, woohoo, I get to lead now and I get to like use <laughs> no, all my experience. They want to use, wisdom. They want to use you as a mirror usually. Right. right? And so yeah. if you ask them questions, well, like, well, what do you mean by this? Or what are you thinking of? What do you like to do? Or how do you feel about this? Or, and you, you can gently guide them a little bit by the questions you ask, but really make them sort of think of it. After a few minutes of questioning, they'll, they'll come up with their own answer right. and they'll be like, that guy was so smart. He's so helpful. <laughs> well, like, it's, it's kind of like being a psychotherapist, right? This yeah. is what a lot of therapists do is, mm -hmm. right? They just kind of, you know, mirror questions back to you so you figure out the answer yourself. Right? Right. And then they're like, wow, you're so wise. Well, just, I'm just a mirror, right? But it's, it's, also, it's also really important to understand, and yeah. a friend of mine is going through this right now, that uh, different people work in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and this friend of mine recently got a new job, and you know, her manager is used to working in a very specific way. It's a very rigid uh, format where the people that report to him give him feedback and reports and everything's done up in Gantt charts and you know flows mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And she's more like the kind of person, she gets a lot of stuff done, but she's definitely has a different working style. It's more like, okay, let's just go and round this stuff up. We're gonna make the impossible happen on schedule. And, right. and he doesn't care. She showed up and she's like, well, this guy isn't really digging what I do. I'm just going to do it and then he'll get it. And she knocked everything out of the park. And he was like, you know, you're just not doing well. <laughs> and 
but because you know so as a manager it's it's incredibly important or a leader it's incredibly important to understand what your style is that you prefer to work in mm -hmm. understand the value that the other different working styles bring in your teams and really encourage the growth of people in those in those working styles and not try and squash them because you can really screw up somebody who's really good right and one of the other points that you make in your talk is that developing the development of soft skills is almost as important or nearly as important as the development of the technology. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that and why, why that is? Soft skills. Um, probably talking about emotional intelligence as sort of a baseline, right? Um, you can't help people, you can't remove roadblocks and coach them if you don't, if you're not able to read them and understand their emotions, if you're not able to appreciate their working style. Um, a lot of, I mean, we should talk about the main thrust of the book, when we talk about soft skills, we, we, we trace everything back to sort of three root causes, um, or three root uh, fun, fundamental ideas underneath soft skills, humility, respect, and trust. And what we say is, if you look at any interaction between two people, or even the way a team interacts, every problem that you ever have, every social problem, can be traced back to a lack of humility, or a lack of respect, or a lack of trust, or, or some, um, <laughs> some combination of the three, right? Um, and so, um, when we talk about soft skills, what, we, what we're really talking about in the book is like, as an individual, here are ways for you to increase your humility. Uh, if you're trying to create a solid team culture, here's a way to increase respect and trust among the culture, and that's what's going to keep the culture together, right? Yeah, and that those, those soft skills are, they can be challenging for some people. Again, mm -hmm. some people don't necessarily see the value in them, but a lot of it, for me, as someone who's developed these over my career, I mean, I was... I think I started without a lot of, of skill in this in this particular category. It's like a superpower to some extent when you don't have it, and then you start to cultivate it. And one day you realize you have it, mm -hmm. because you can see things that you normally otherwise didn't see. It's like there's some people that you know they have no idea that the person next to them is raging mad, and you look at them, and you can like literally see the steam coming right. off of their head. You're like, you know, Steve's really mad at you right now. Really. I didn't know that. I'm like, like the dude's clenching his fists. Like, he's and, turning bright red. He's turning bright red. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, and like, this is what's going on. So, it's a, it, it gives you some really good insight, and it enables you to. I, I think there's, there's sometimes a, a tendency to do a one size fits all for people. Like, oh, well, I'm going to manage people, and I'm going to do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. But not everybody needs it. We, we like to say, I think my mother-in-law said about children because she had six kids is that programmers are like plants. Well, she said kids, but I say programmers. Uh, but people are like plants. Some of them need more light, some of them need more water, and some of them need more bullshit. <laughs> and so, like, knowing who needs what is really important. Giving everyone the same thing does no one a service. Uh, but that really takes a lot of insight. The, um, the, the other thesis in the book is that software engineering, or whatever your creative industry is, that it, that it is inherently a team sport, right? Mm. Um, there's no such thing as, as a loner who lone genius who goes out and does everything themselves and creates this wonderful product, right? It's always a collaborative effort. And so these, these things, these superpowers you're talking about, humility, respect, and trust, and learning to cultivate those things, I just used the word cultivate. cultivate. Uh, That's what you did there. Yeah, uh, learning to cultivate those things, that is what makes the machine work. That is what makes the mm -hmm. team sport function at all, right? And so then we get back to the other thesis, which is if you learn to cultivate these powers, the machine the team, the team sport works better, and then you actually end up writing more code and getting more done, right. and mm -hmm. which is what you came for in the first place. But, but it's a force multiplier. It is a force. Like, you can be the smartest and greatest at whatever you do, whatever creative endeavor you do in the world, and come and say, I'm just going to do this and knock it out of the park. The problem is, is that if you're a complete jerk to work with, mm -hmm. or you don't get how to work with other people, that's, that's still not going to save you. It's like, like, I could maybe pick up that giant radiator in the corner of my house, but I could put a fulcrum in a two by four and leverage it up onto a roller thing and do the exact same, accomplish the same thing with a heck of a lot less effort in my part. And that's what, that's what the soft skills are. Right. It's, it's a fulcrum and a lever. And so all of these best practices that you've yeah. put together in the book and for team building and managing people, how do those play out in your own personal lives, in your own personal careers? Our personal lives are a wreck. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, I mean, we both changed like sort of what we do in the last year. Like, I left Google, started a company yeah. uh, with a friend, and you know, I've built a team and a culture. And so, this has really been a—it could have been a disaster. It's really been, a, I think, a great opportunity <laughs> for me to, to practice what I preach mm -hmm. for so long. Um, but it's been fantastic. It's—it's it's 
been a learning experience. I've definitely made some mistakes along the way. Um, but it I mean, is, same with me. I mean, yeah. Um, I, I recently got put in charge of the, the Google Chicago engineering office, right? Um, so it was I've a bloodless a, coup. Really. Bloodless coup. Well, but but I mean, rough, <laughs> roughly a hundred programmers, um, and I'm supposed to be in charge of their well-being and their you know how just the overall health of the office. And so, all of those skills are super critical, right? Um, I, I feel like I spend most of my time just going around, checking to make sure everyone is happy and healthy and has the technical and has the social and we have the right projects and just, just doing temperature checks, right? Yeah, and it's the blip thing. And yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> you have a great story. <laughs> well, I mean, so, the, well, the original story, right, was about, um, well, you tell, tell the original but, story. What? Do you remember? I'm talking about your parents? About, no, about the ch- Oh, oh gosh, no, no. I was about the chalk mark. Oh, there's the, there's a the famous story yeah, about this, the chalk mark first. this yeah. computer company that's are having this terrible problem with this machine. They can't get right. it fixed, so right. they call in the old retired guy who was really the great engineer. And he comes in and he looks at it and he taps at it and he listens and all, and he pulls a piece of chalk out of his pocket right. and he puts a little X on the machine. He's like, "Drill here, and you'll find a loose thing and you'll connect it. It'll, that'll fix everything." And they're very thankful. The CEO says, "You know, please send us a bill for your work." And all he sends him back a bill. You know. Find the, find the problem, $10,000. CEO's like, well, hey, look, you know, I know you're worth a lot of time, but can you send an itemized bill back? He said, yes. He said, piece of chalk, chalk mark, $1. <laughs> Knowing where to put the chalk mark, $9,999. Right. And I think that's a lot of what you talk about doing. Well, right, right. So, so I love that story because it, I feel like a lot of the way I, I manage teams or large organizations is I don't bark commands and try to micromanage everything. I spend most of my week just listening to people. Right, listen, 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 listen. What's going on? What's going on? And I imagine my team like like a giant blimp, sort of. You know, they're flying a blimp. It's going slowly in one direction, right? And at the end of the week, after I've listened to everybody, I take my chalk mark and I draw a little chalk mark on the blimp, and then I tap it in that one spot, right? And it's just a tiny, tiny course correction, right? But knowing where to put it, right? It took me an entire week to figure out where to put that chalk mark. Yeah. But that's it. That's my one intervention of the week, right? And so presumably that's why why they're paying me the medium bucks. <laughs> so, so, but but that's it, right? That's 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 a form of management, right? Less is more, right? If you're careful about it. So yeah, that's that's, that's true leadership. <laughs> okay. I would argue Ma- management would be like grabbing the blimp and no, trying to force it way. one way or that. But as a result of that, when you take a vacation for a week or two, or come to New York for work, or mm-hmm. speak at a conference, or be interviewed in a podcast, yeah. you know everything doesn't come to a screeching halt. Right. You know things still continue just just fine an example, right? Teams should be self-sustaining, yeah. self-managed, right? You want to replace yourself eventually, right? That's, important. Yeah, so that's a good point. So train your replacement. That's what I always, what I, I tell new managers. Ultimately, your job is to, is to raise more managers, mm-hmm. right? So, so that um, if anything ever happens to you, there's another leader ready to step up, or if you just want to switch projects, right? right. Or switch companies or whatever. Right? Yeah, give so, yourself some mobility and freedom. Yeah, right. Right. So, yeah. So I want to close out our conversation yeah. today with sort of a general, personal <laughs> question. Okay. Um, what are you really interested in right now? What is what is fascinating you at the moment? What people or projects are you following? Well, right now, I mean, I as, as somebody who's like building a company, it's been a lot of learning about just generally startups and small companies and how things grow. And, and a lot of thought is what kind of company do I want to grow? Not just from the culture of my team, but, mm-hmm. you know, how big are we going to be? How are we going to do this? Is it better to, to, to do this in an established way um, thing, or do we use one of our innovation chits, right? Because you only get so many innovation chits. Every time you do something that's not tried and tested, you're taking a risk. And you, if you gamble on too many of these things, you're likely to completely collapse in a pile of stuff. So it's been a lot of like digging in, into that, and it's been really, it's been really fascinating. It's, it's like been, a strategic board game, right? It, am I going to play this chit now or later? Yeah, it is. It's <laughs> like, okay, am I going to play the steel block or the balloon, you know? Uh, and too many balloons and everything floats away. So uh, that's, wow. that's been a real challenge for me. Uh, I, I'm I'm very passionate. I, I collect hobbies, as Fitz says. So I have many many hobbies and passions outside of the world of tech and leadership and all that. Right, um, right now I'm learning to sketch and draw things, and it's, it's a lot of fun. But in the world of tech, um, I what's really got me um, passionate right now is is just dealing with the the problems of diversity in the tech industry. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a big hot topic now. Everyone's talking about it. Everybody knows how awful the diversity numbers are in the tech industry. Google, I think Google was the first to release those numbers, and then a bunch of other companies followed suit. Transparency. Transparency. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard problem, right? And Google has 
you know, a lot of uh, a lot of efforts to try to change the pipeline and then try to change the culture within to make it more inclusive. And that's something we talk about is that you know the really high functioning teams that we've ever that we've seen are ones that have the greatest diversity, right? Racial or gender or, or income diversity. Like those teams are the most innovative and the most resilient and create the best products. But how do you how do you make that happen? How do you get them into the tech world? How do you retain them? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really hard problem, but I'm 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 in a lot of conversations about that, right? Yeah. So um, okay. I have no magic answers. <laughs> Well, thank you both very yeah. much for talking with me today. It's been a lot of fun. My pleasure, yeah. Great. Great to see Thanks you. for having us.